Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Nupp, Professor of Music and Organ at Mississippi College in Clinton, Mississippi. And I'd like for you to join me on a journey through the area around Leipzig, Germany, in a lecture which I call Lessons from Leipzig. These are the lessons that I learned from having a five week journey in and around Leipzig, Germany. There's a statue of J.S. Bach, which is outside of the St. Thomas Church. It shows him later in his career in this photo that I took. Uh, around back, you maybe can't see, there's an organ, a little positive organ behind him, uh, standing there presiding over a little square. That's inside the church with the sour organ. And you can see by the high ceiling, it's a, quite a large structure. And it's really quite impressive. I just met every expectation you had of a German church, especially ones that my teachers had told me. The German organs had large pedal divisions, and the rooms were all amazing acoustics, and that the box music was somehow sacred and untouchable. Uh, the lessons that we're about, I'm about to share with you maybe challenge a few of those misconceptions. Uh, lesson one, acoustics. Not all German churches have amazing acoustics. Um, this one was in Leipzig, Church of the Apostles, organ by Ruhlmann. You can see it there, it's a fairly low ceiling. Um, the acoustics were typical of an American church, which is something I really didn't expect given that I had been told time and time again how every church in Europe has amazing acoustics. That's simply not the case. Um, Journey to a town called Rudelstadt, a little outside of Leipzig. as one of the few later gas organs that are left. Uh, legend has that Liszt played on this organ once. And as you can see, it's in a second balcony. But once again, the acoustics weren't as live as you'd expect them to be. But it was more live than the first church. This is another organ. This is a Volker organ, a church in Emanau. It's totally original, except for the metal pipes in the front, which were melted down during one of the world wars. Uh, the second lesson I learned here, when playing German romantic organ music, it's okay for the sound to be very powerful. This organ was very mighty. It, it shook the balcony. It's okay to really pull a lot of stops on and to let it, let it, let it play a little bit when playing German romantic organ music. Um, Arnstadt. This is one of the first jobs Bach had, and there you see the young Bach, sort of in a teenage uh, reclined position, very uh, contrasting from the one outside of St. Thomas. I learned the third lesson here, and this was the first big one. Uh, for some Bach works, the pedal notes on Bach organs aren't there. For example, BWV 535, written at Arnstadt, has a C-sharp two in the pedal, which isn't on the organ there. So as I was playing the piece, I go for hit the C sharp and it's not there. I turn to the organist and he said, just, just play another C sharp, which I thought was okay, I, I can understand that. And as you can tell, this, this church is much larger than some I've, I've been in before. Uh, it's on the third balcony. He had to climb up two. Uh, there's a second organ that takes up the first and second balconies behind the grill work there. Uh, the organ's a, a reproduction of the vendor organ that has been there. Um, and it was, it was quite, quite high up in the church. Um, Walters Hausen, the organ there, the pedal board was 30% wider than any organ I've ever played. It's Guinness certified as the world's widest pedal board. Uh, look at the carvings there at the edge of the keyboards. Uh, I had great difficulty playing the pedals here uh, because the C to the C, it was, it was so wide, so wide. And when I said to the organist there, well, how do you play some of these pedal passages in Bach? He said, well, you, you learn or you adapt. And that's the second time someone had mentioned adapting works. And so I started to get some, some uh, inklings of, of a question coming up, but I was just a little too afraid to ask it at this point. So I started wondering, all right, so Bach played organs and he wrote notes that those organs don't have. Uh, some of these pedal boards in Middle Germany are so wide, you can barely play the pedals at all. 
All the organs have a lot of color variety on the manuals, which is something I didn't really expect, but a little more than a single or three pedal stops. Whereas in the North, where Books to Huda was, you know, those organs had a full pedal, and I think that's where we got a lot of our ideas from. And of course, Bach, when he consulted an organ later on in his life, he did ask for a full pedal division, but those aren't the realities that he was composing for. Um, more modern German organs really didn't sound like I expected. They were very powerful. And so I'm really beginning to wonder and questioning why I was told the things I were about German organs and music. And I think that has to do with the fact that up until about 20 years ago, it was very difficult to get into the eastern part of Germany, which is where Bach lived. So we base all our assumptions on what was in the West Germany, or kind of the North or in the Western parts. Um, at a town called Bad Salzungen, I played a recital and a church service, although I don't speak German, it was interesting. Uh, when I played the organ, I wasn't too familiar with how to use the registration aids. There just aren't many of these types of organs in the United States. And the organist said, well, now's a great time to learn. So I learned very quickly <clears throat> how to play registration aids on a German romantic organ. This is a sour organ given to the church by Max Reger, and there it is. This was in the front of the church above the pulpit area, which you can see there beneath the organ. And that is the console. There's a little camera there for you to be able to see what's going on, a nice three manual organ there. And there's no registration A uh, pistons like we would have it. Those are all different. Um, if you go to Germany, learn. Um, Stormtal, which is a little town right on the outskirts of Leipzig. J.S. Bach dedicated this organ, played the first concert on it, and Anna Magdalena sang on the program. Um, the Hildebrand organ there, he was an apprentice of Silbermann, has not been altered at all. It's original. So that's the original bench, which you're not supposed to sit on. So I took a picture of it. And that's the console. Uh, one manual, I should tell the manual compass isn't what we would expect. And as I was playing, if you ran out of keys, I'm sure the response would have been, well, just alter the music. Rotha, uh, two historic Silvermont organs in this town. And I start to gather that there's kind of like, we have AGO standard. They kind of have a Silvermont standard, so to speak. A lot of mill German organs are laid out the same. The, the principles and flutes and strings in the same position on the consoles, the pedal board dimensions, roughly the same, the keyboard dimensions, roughly the same. So if you play one, pretty much you, you could play many of them, which was good because in a town called Forchheim, little did I know there were six Forchheims in Germany. So I go that morning and I put in the car's GPS system, the name of this church in Forchheim, and off I went. And I get to that church and there's a placard for an organ recital and someone else's name is on it. So I called my contact and she said, well, you're supposed to be at this four time, not that four time. So I had to get back in the car and I actually got a speeding ticket on the Autobahn that day. Yes, you can get one if they believe you're driving uh, too aggressively. And I think I must have been because I did get a, a ticket of it. I have the receipt to prove it. And I arrived 30 minutes to the right four time before the concert and learned in lesson six was make sure you check that you're going to the exact four time. Uh, similar layout to those I played in Rotha. So I wasn't that unprepared because I'd spent a lot of time in Rotha playing those two organs. So when I got here, I basically knew what I was going to be doing, which was great. And seeing I arrived 30 minutes before concert, very frat frazzled from that. So one of the culminating events of this trip was I went to the Bach Museum for a visit and I met a few hours with Dr. Christine Blanken. She's one of the lead researchers and musicologists there and the organ specialist. And she and I had a very interesting talk. Uh, the summary of it would be um, Bach did rewrite his music for varying levels of students. And she knows this and has proven this because you can go on the Bach Digital Archive and see for every Bach Prelude and Fugue, for example, there's probably four or five different manuscripts. And each of those, the notes are a little bit different. Some are harder than others. And if you look at other Preludes and Fugues by Bach, and you look at the same person who transcribed them, you'll notice that some of them are very more difficult than others, and it's consistent. Uh, she said that Krebs was basically 
the most reliable, and his organ playing was kind of nearer the top, but not quite. Uh, there were two other students who copied down who have many more advanced passages of music that Krebs doesn't have, but he certainly was more advanced than most of them. So she said, most of what we base our Bach manuscripts on are Krebs versions. Um, he rewrote, and the scribes of the music rewrote music to accommodate key and pedal compasses, so the organ didn't have a couple of notes, uh, Bach or his students would just put in another key. I mean, he was flexible and adaptable. So when they said to me, well, just play another C sharp, that's what Bach would have done. Just played another C sharp. He rewrote his music for varying levels of students. He wanted all his students to be able to play it and realize that, hey, I just want the music played. So to play a quote unquote easier version would have been okay. Which, so the Bach himself was adapting his own music. He was more of a craftsman of music. Um, in the works he did publish, he was inconsistent in articulation. And uh, Bach only recycled three years of cantatas in his entire time in Leipzig. There aren't thousands of lost cantatas of Bach. He just sub out an aria or rewrite a couple passages, and that seemed to appease the town fathers. So here's Bach. He wanted to be a well-known as a great composer and was willing to modify his music to make it accessible to a larger performer base, which means more people heard it. He was deeply concerned about musicianship and not one way of getting to the end of that. He was a real person at a home life, a social life, and daily stresses in life, just like us. So as you play Bach and explore Bach, just know that he was a real person with real concerns. And how this journey changed my approach to music, I mean, number one, it affirmed my belief that um, individual musical interpretation is the best way. There's more than one way of playing a piece musically. We shouldn't say, well, that's the way it has to be done. That isn't how Bach thought. That isn't how we should think. Number two, Bach's organs had very few pedal stops. So by using just a 16-foot flute or principle, couple that to the great, it eliminates many, if not all, the balance issues that we have in Bach between pedal solo and pedal ensemble passages. We don't have to continually be pressing pistons to get those balances if you just put a 16 foot stop in the pedal and couple it to the grade. I mean, I think perhaps organists saw North Germany with their big independent pedal divisions and thought that's the way it is across all Germany. Really not true, but that's the, another uh, presentation. This trip made me want to explore more. There's no better way to learn about music than by immersing yourself into the place where that music is written. So you can definitely see how the composer thought about their music and what they intended to do with it. So I hope that this short lecture uh, kind of gives you a couple questions and to start exploring on your own. And I do thank you for watching.